<laughs> That's an interesting trajectory, but starting off with older folks and ending up with older folks. Right? That's right, and it just it felt right. And from the moment that I went to graduate school, I was connected to aging. I loved graduate school and just the study of aging yeah. and gerontology. It was, it's so interesting that you got um, practical experience before you went to grad school um, because with you know the population that you're interested in working with, with um, because now it's sort of the reverse, right? You get that practical experience while you're in graduate school, so. That's right, really? that's right. And it was wonderful because when I was working on this bicentennial project mm -hmm. through the National Easter Seal Society, because we were trying to coordinate um, advocacy groups with older adults as well as people with disabilities, I learned some of my community organization skills yeah. there that have served me well. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, okay, so I think you've already done a little bit of this, but describing your career trajectory as a gerontologist, um, more so, when did you become a gerontologist mm -hmm. per se, right? Like, when did that label mm -hmm. come about for you? Well, I have to say that I never fully identified as a social worker. Mm -hmm. It was really gerontology that I was drawn to. And I have a master's in social welfare with a specialization in gerontology, but always thought of myself as a gerontologist. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from graduate school at Berkeley, my first job um, out of graduate school was at the University of California in San Francisco working with pioneers like Dr. Carol Estes mm. and Dr. Bob Newcomer on an aging health policy study um, where I was working on interviewing um, public officials to see how the emerging state agencies on aging mm. and then new area agencies on aging oh. were implementing policy in the community. Um, and from there on, I was a committed gerontologist, and my next job was as an area agency on aging planner in Marin County, California. I was there for five years, and then was recruited to work at um, what was then known as the Family Survival Project, and the organization changed its name to the Family Caregiver Alliance where the executive director was looking for someone who could bridge the world of research and practice. And I thought, I can do that job. And what my job was at the Family Caregiver Alliance was to help replicate our program of family caregiver support throughout the state of California. Legislation had recently been enacted to replicate Family Caregiver Alliance's model statewide. So I was hired to work with uh, different communities and different resource centers across the state to really replicate what we were doing. What's now called translational yeah. work, at the time it was called replication. And I was with the Family Caregiver Alliance for 23 years, wow. a long time, mm -hmm. building that organization, building our advocacy platform, doing policy research and applied research to really move the field forward so that people recognized that it was important not only to help the older adult with cognitive impairment like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, but also to support the family. And we helped um, get funded and housed at Family Caregiver Alliance, the first national center on caregiving. Yeah. So it was a long trajectory of work right there. Yeah, lots of pioneering stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Should I go on? Yeah, okay. absolutely. And then um, the next phase of my career took a different turn um, from doing policy and applied research with a community-based nonprofit agency. Um, I was fortunate to um, apply and be selected for um, the John Hines Senate Fellowship in Aging. Senator Hines had been the chair of the Senate Special Committee on Aging, and there was a fellowship in the U.S. Senate to work with a senator on aging issues, and it was um, a transformative experience for me. I um, worked in my then senator's office, Senator Barbara Boxer from California, um, really informing and educating that whole Senate office about aging issues, 
And I remember when I um, started out my first day there, here I am, this older woman in a Senate office where most of the staff are younger, in their 20s. And Senator Boxer was on the Foreign Relations Committee and chair of the Environment and Public Works Committee. And these young men and women are saying, aging? You're going to work on aging issues? How does that relate to what the <laughs> senator's doing? And I said, you're going to love aging by the time I leave. And they did. And I had the privilege of um, drafting a loan forgiveness piece of legislation for Senator Boxer, the Caring for an Aging America Act. Um, that almost, almost moved several years later in Congress, um, but it was truly um, an, an amazing experience to learn public policy firsthand um, being in Congress. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yes. It seems such like it's such a different experience to actually be writing legislation and writing policy at such an, a broad level, a macro level. Absolutely. National. Absolutely. Moving it forward. Yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So impressive. Is that? So um, then I um, ended up at the end of my fellowship. I went back to California and then decided for a variety of reasons to relocate to the East Coast and um, moved to Washington, D.C and um, had a position at the National Partnership for Women and Families to head up the Campaign for Better Care. That was an initiative to um, get older adults and their families engaged in reforming health care. Mm -hmm. I was there when the Affordable Care Act was being debated um, and involved in some of that advocacy and policy development. It was quite an experience. And then very fortunate to um, become a senior strategic policy advisor at the AARP Public Policy Institute where I work now, um, working on our family caregiving and long-term care and livable communities team at the Public Policy Institute. And i just delighted to um, be there because family caregiving issues and family care issues, which has been my life career work is now front and center at AARP, such a critical, important issue for our members. And um, I am able to help in many different ways as a family caregiving expert. So um, I really value the opportunity at this stage in my career to help influence um, positive social change at the national level and also working with some of our state offices on state campaigns to support family caregivers as well. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing career. And to be, it seems like where you really want to be right now, at just the right time, working on things that you want. It, seems it is, the stars, the stars are aligned. Yeah. And throughout all of this, um, early on in my career, I joined the Gerontological Society of America and the American Society on Aging, which at the time when I joined was the Western Gerontological mm -hmm. Society, and um, found my professional home, if you will, because I um, was not a rigorous researcher, mm -hmm. applied researcher, so more of my home, professional home, was with the American Society on Aging, and became very involved early on, made very important um, professional friendships, and met so many colleagues and leaders in the field of aging and kind of grew up through the ranks, working on different committees and whatnot. And I'm now chair of the board of directors of the American Society on Aging. I'm very honored to have that role. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. Um, I think that's a good segue into the next question, I believe, which is, um, did you have uh, women mentors who impacted your move into gerontology? Um, who were they? And um, what do you think is unique about being a woman gerontologist? Mm -hmm. Well, I did have women mentors. Um, my first mentor was Carol Estes, Dr. Carol Estes, um, who I worked with um, when I was in my late 20s, so it's a long, long time ago. And um, Carol really instilled in me the importance of getting involved in committees, 
and getting involved in national professional organizations like ASA and GSA. Um, she was very um, um, important in my career development in that regard. Also, um, women leaders like Robin Stone, Dr. Robin Stone, who is now at Leading Age here in Washington, D.C. And Robin, for a lot of her career, was working on family caregiving issues. And she really talked to me about the importance of, in gerontology, carving out your area of focus and having an area of expertise. And in my case, it's been on family caregiving issues. And related to that, I would say one of um, our early pioneers in the field who I, uh, was a real role model for me was Elaine Brody, who worked at the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, um, who recently passed away. And um, Elaine was a role model for me because she did some of the important early research on family caregiving issues, but she didn't have her doctorate. She had an MSW, yeah. so I thought, I could do this too, yeah. applied research. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, she was very influential in my early career. And then um, Robin Golden, a social worker who's now at Rush University Medical Center, um, has been a role model for me uh, because she really taught me and mentored me on the importance of listening to our colleagues who may have diverse points of view, and the art of connection, mm -hmm. um, and how important it is to network and um, build those collegial relationships, again, to make positive change in aging. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you think is uh, unique about being a woman gerontologist? It's unique about being a woman gerontologist? Well, it's near and dear to my heart, family caregiving is primarily a women's issue, although not exclusively a women's issue. It's a family issue too, and increasingly more men are stepping up to the plate, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, but I think women gerontologists have a unique perspective because I think oftentimes we look um, in policy research and practice through a family lens and a family systems lens. And the other thing I would say about women gerontologists is we're more likely to be the family caregivers, but we're also more likely to be the care recipients mm -hmm. in old, old age. So we have that unique um, perspective as the consumer and the provider and that family-focused, uh, broad focus. Yes. <laughs> So how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? How has it interacted with my personal aging process? Well, um, I'm a planner by training. <laughs> so um, with my family, they know that I'm going to be there to be talking about the importance of having the conversation about what your care preferences are in old age mm -hmm. and doing advanced directives and all of that. Um, and at this stage in my career, being in gerontology for so many years really has impressed upon me the importance of family and friends and the lived experience um, of um, community. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I have some of that perspective because I'm a gerontologist. I'm <laughs> thinking about myself yeah. being a younger gerontologist yes. um, and how being among older people influences how I view myself aging and having to check myself sometimes and right. um, knowing that older people actually are my community in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, so all of that made a lot of sense to me. <laughs> Great. Uh, so the project focuses on legacies of older women gerontologists. Um, within that framework, is there anything else you'd like us to know in terms of uh, legacy of women gerontologists in general, your own legacy? Well, I think this project um, is critically important. I care very much about mentoring the next generation 
and um, in my role as chair of the board of directors of the American Society on Aging, I'm really trying to look at all new ideas of how to engage younger people in aging. So we need to have more intergenerational and cross-generational focus on aging. And I care very deeply about my relationships with um, meeting younger women like yourself. I will be friends. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and being a sounding board and just being there for the next generation. You are our future. And we, because of the aging of the population and because there will be less family members, mm -hmm. the smaller family size, to provide the care in the future, we really need to get more people with strong heart and good mind to be involved in gerontology.